I'm going to call the meeting to order for the City of Iowa City formal meeting for May 3rd, 2022. I want to welcome everyone to City Hall, and I'm going to start. Roll call, please. Alter. Here. Burgess. Here. <clears throat> Farmson. Here. Taylor. Here. Teague. Here. Thomas. Here. Weiner. Here. All right, again, welcome to your city hall. Happy to see you all in person and actually in the city hall. We had been over in the senior center for a long, long time. And to everyone virtually, welcome to you as well. And first item is going to be proclamations, item two. And 2A is gonna be the Asian Pacific American Heritage Month and Asian American and Pacific Islander Day Against Bullying. Whereas Asian Pacific Her American Heritage Month was first proposed as a commemorative week by Representative Frank Horton of New York and signed into law by J President Jimmy Carter, with the week's first recognition being in 1979, but was amended to its present form of an annual ce celebratory month in 1992. And whereas the term Asian Pacific is very broad and includes many peoples and cultures from the entire Asian continent to the Pacific Island groups of Micronesia, Melanesia, and Polynesia, and thus encompasses diverse populations within one group destination. And whereas the contributions Americans of Asian and Pacific Island heritage have made to this society are too many and varied to list comprehensively. And whereas the API community is the fastest growing racial group in America and today is an important moment to recognize not only our long-term communities, but also our newcomers. Asian Pacific Americans have made contributions ranging from building connections to the rest of the US, with a transcontinental railroad, to service with Valor and our armed forces, to the fields of agriculture, business, education, health, and technology. And whereas the API community has marked by a struggle for freedom, equality, and justice prevalent over the adversity of exclusion, persecution, incarceration, and disparities. And whereas May 18th is the birthday of Vincent Chin, who was brutally murdered in a hate crime in 1982. His murder fueled a national Asian American activist moment that continues to this day. And whereas we have seen a staggering rise in bullying, discrimination, and hate crimes against the Asian American and Pacific Islander community during the COVID-19 pandemic, and whereas in honor of Asian Pacific Her American Heritage Month and Vincent Chin birthday, May 18th shall be an API day against bullying and hate. And whereas ACT to Change is a national nonprofit dedicated to fighting bullying in the Asian American and Pacific Islander community. To find resources, visit acttochange.org. And now and therefore I, Bruce Teague, Mayor of Iowa City, do hereby proclaim the month of May 2022 to be Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. And do hereby proclaim Wednesday, May 18th to be Asian American and Pacific Islander Day Against Bullying in Iowa City and urge all community members to join ACT to Change. The City of Iowa City is committed to this important issue and encourages the public to foster dialogue, share resources, and learn more about what they can do to fight bullying. And to receive this proclamation is Human Rights Commissioner Mark Priest. <coughs> Welcome. And I'm gonna give you this proclamation. So Mayor Tig and Councilors, on behalf of the residents of Iowa City and the Iowa City Human Rights Commission and staff, we're grateful for this proclamation of this May as Asian Pacific Heritage Month and Wednesday, May 18th as Asian American and Pacific Islander Day Against Bullying. As a diverse Iowa community, residents of Iowa City have the privilege to become culturally aware and empathetic toward our minority residents. We can be allies for each other, and then come such times as these when we must increase our ability and willingness to be advocates for minority residents and new residents of Iowa City. 
And now, because of racist rhetoric from leaders, our Asian American and Pacific Islander neighbors welcome proclamations just such as this one that are beyond rhetoric and inspire attention, advocacy, and change. Thank you very much. Thank you. Item 2B is Bicycle Month and Bike to Work Week. And this will be read by Councilor Burgess. Whereas the bicycle is an economical, healthy, and environmentally sound form of transportation, recreation, and enjoyment. And whereas increasing bicycle access and safety enables residents of Iowa City, including young people, to participate more fully in the educational, social, and economic life of our community. And whereas the metro area bicycle network, including our off-street trail system, now attracts bicycle tourism and economic development that helps to support and sustain local businesses. And whereas throughout the month of May, residents of Iowa City can experience the joys of bicycling by participating in educational programs, rides, commuting events, charity events, or by simply going for a ride. And whereas these activities create greater public awareness of rights and responsibilities of bicyclists to improve safety for all. Now, therefore, on behalf of Bruce Teague, Mayor of Iowa City, I do hereby proclaim May 2022 to be Bicycle Month and May 16th to 22nd as Bike to Work Week in Iowa City and urge all residents who are able to join in this observance by bicycling for fitness, recreation, or to commute to work. Further, I ask all motorists to drive safely and with full attention to the road by putting away electronic devices, obeying all traffic signs, signals, and speed limits, sharing the road by allowing no less than five feet of separation when passing a cyclist, or taking to the adjacent lane to pass on roads with speed limits over 25 miles per hour, and yielding to bicyclists and pedestrians as required by law. And to accept this proclamation is Aria Sabiti from Bike Iowa City. All right, thanks, Mayor. Uh, I actually came with a nice speech, but uh, Councilor Taylor there really, I think, prejudiced my speech. It was word for word what I wanted to say. Um, for me, biking started as a journey to better my health. Uh, over this, the last seven years, uh, I found out that you know I could see more of the community, uh, the economics of, of biking, going to different towns from Iowa City to North Liberty. The accessibility has greatly increased. Um, as you pointed out, uh, driving distracted is a big uh, danger to cyclists. So seeing more pathways for cyclists to actually get to div these different parts of town has been really uh, a, a godsend to us. Um, so we want to thank you very much for all the continued uh, infrastructure um, involvement that you've been doing and development across uh, all uh, cities between here, Iowa City, Solon, and North Liberty. So thank you very much for all the hard work you're doing on that. Thank you. Thank you. Item 2C is Jewish American Heritage Month, and this will be read by Councilor Weiner. Whereas the Jewish American experience, as President Biden so aptly proclaimed last year, quote, is a story of faith, fortitude, and progress, it is a quintessential American experience one that is connected to key tenets of American identity, including our nation's commitment to freedom of religion and conscience. This month, we honor Jewish Americans, past and present, who have inextricably woven their experience and their accomplishments into the fabric of our national identity. Generations of Jewish people have come to this nation fleeing oppression, discrimination, and persecution in search of a better life for themselves and their children. These Jewish Americans have created lives for themselves and their families and played indispensable roles in our nation's civic and community life, making invaluable contributions to our nation through their leadership and achievements, close quote. And whereas equal opportunity for all, regardless of age, color, creed, disability, familial status, gender identity, marital status, national origin, presence or absence of dependents, public assistance, source of income, race, religion, sex, or sexual orientation, is a fundamental goal of our city. 
And whereas we recognize the historic accomplishments of Jewish Americans, such as Moses Bloom, the mayor of Iowa City from 1873 to 1875, and the first Jewish mayor of an American city, Libby Hyman of, of Des Moines, author of the 1919 volume, A Laboratory Manual for Elementary Zoology, Philip Roth, American novelist who taught at the University of Iowa's Writers' Workshop in 1960. And whereas, as the president further proclaimed, quote, alongside this, alongside this narrative of achievement and opportunity, there is also a history of racism, bigotry, and other forms of injustice. This includes the scourge of anti-Semitism. In recent years, Jewish Americans have increasingly been the target of white nationalism and anti-Semitic violence it fuels. As our nation strives to heal these wounds and overcome these challenges, let us acknowledge and celebrate the crucial contributions the Jewish Americans have made to our collective struggle for a more just and fair society, leading movements for social justice, working to ensure that the opportunities they have secured are extended to others, and heeding the words of the Torah, justice, justice shall you pursue. We honor Jewish Americans who, inspired by Jewish values and American ideals, have engaged in the ongoing work of forming a more perfect union." Close quote. Now, therefore, on behalf of Bruce Teague, mayor of Iowa City, I do hereby proclaim May 2022 to be Jewish American Heritage Month. Uh, and accepting this proclamation is uh, Mark Priest, Human Rights Commissioner. Councilor Weiner and Mayor Teague, all councilors, on behalf of the residents of Iowa City and the Iowa, Human, Iowa City Human Rights Commission and staff, we're grateful for this proclamation of May 2022 being designated Jewish American Heritage Month in Iowa City. The planting of the Anne Frank chestnut tree at the Pentecost just this past Friday, the day after Yom Hashanah. Oh insists and inspires us all the more to dedicate our lives as a whole community to Anne Frank's vision of what can be. At the planting of the chestnut tree, Councillor Weiner recalled Anne's naming in her journal, What Could Be, quoting, when I look up at the sky, I somehow feel that everything will change for the better, that this cruelty too will end, that peace and tranquility will return once more, end of quote. Years ago, Leslie and I took our children to the secret annex. We went up the steep stairs hidden by the bookcase, visiting the rooms and especially looking out the window through the chestnut tree to see the facade of the Western Torn in the, distant, in the distance just brought chills to us, this facade of what we would know as Westerkirk. This established Christian institution in Amsterdam is a symbol for me of what mindless religion tolerates while the horror of Holocaust fell upon Jewish residents in the Netherlands. Anne wrote about the Westerkirk five days into her stay at the annex. Daddy, Mommy, and Margot can't get used to the sound of the Westertorn clock yet, which tells us the time every quarter of an hour. I can. I love it from the start, and especially in the night, it's like a faithful friend. Jewish American Heritage Month brings our whole city an opportunity to give thanks for the blessings of the Jewish community in Iowa City, for Agudas Hakim Synagogue, more than 100 years old, and to renew our mutual efforts to name and protect the human rights of every citizen, each of us faithful friends. Thank you. Thank you. Item 2D is National Public Works Week. Whereas public works professional of the Iowa City Public Works Department focus on infrastructure, facilities, and services that are vital and important to a sustainable and resilient community and to the public health, high quality of life, and well-being of the city of Iowa City. And whereas these infrastructure facilities and services cannot be provided without the dedicated efforts of our public works professionals who are responsible for maintaining, improving, and protecting our transportation, water supply, water treatment, and solid waste systems, public buildings, 
and other structures and facilities essential for our community members. And whereas it is in the public's interest for the community members and civic leaders to gain knowledge of and maintain a progressive interest and in understanding the, the importance of public works and public works programs in Iowa City. And whereas the year 2022 marks the 62nd annual National Public Works Week sponsored by the American Public Works Association, and whereas the 2022 National Public Works Week theme is ready and resilient, this theme highlights the ability of the public works professionals to perform regular public work duties and be ready at a moment's notice to react as first responders during natural disasters and overcoming challenges seen in the field. Now, therefore, I, Bruce Teague, Mayor of Iowa City, do hereby proclaim the week of May 15th to May 21st, 2022, to be National Public Works Week in Iowa City and urge all community members and civic organizations to acquaint themselves with the issues involved in providing our public works and to recognize the, the substantial contributions which public works professionals make every day to our health, safety, comfort, and quality of care, quality of life. And to receive this is our public works director, Ron Kanoki. Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council, uh, good evening. On behalf of the 166 Public Works professionals in the Iowa City Public Works Department, I would like to thank you for the National Public Works Week proclamation. The dedicated professionals who work in our engineering, equipment, resource management, streets, wastewater, and water divisions exemplify this year's theme, Ready and Resilient. Whether we are providing the everyday services made more challenging by COVID or responding to extreme weather events, the Public Works Department is ready and here to serve our community. I would like to thank you for your support of our operations. Uh, last year, I reported the Public Works Facility Phase 1 project was recognized by the American Public Works Association as the Public Works Project of the Year in the Structures category for 2021. This year, this project has been recognized by the American Institute of Architects Committee on Environment with one of the 2022 Cody Top 10 Awards. Uh, we look forward to Saturday, May 21st, when we will have the opportunity to showcase this building with an open house. We invite all community members to stop by between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. The city will have vehicles from its fleet on display with a touch a truck event. You have the ability to learn more about the, the services the city provides as well as tours of the new building and the fire training tower. We will also have indoor roller skating, live music, food vendors, and a quilt show in partnership with the Old Capital Quilters Guild. Uh, the quilt show has been titled Beauties Amongst the Beasts. <laughs> the Summer of the Arts will host a free screening of the Field of Dreams at the Napoleon Park at sunset. Uh, the Public Works Open House will be held during National Public Works Week on Saturday, May 21st at 3810 Napoleon Lane between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. And parking for the event will be available at the Napoleon Park Softball Complex. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to um, get, could I get a motion to approve our consent? Calendar, which is items three through seven. So moved. Second. <coughs> All right. And would anyone from the public like to address the, any item on our consent agenda? If you are present, we ask that you come forth. Uh, there are sign-in sheets that you can sign in at the podium. There are also stickers at the back that you can place in the basket at the podium. And we ask that you limit your comments to three minutes or less, and we're going to welcome you today. Hello, my name is Brandon Ross, um, Iowa City resident, United States citizen. I, uh, listening to all the, uh, the intros about Asian American Day and the bicycles and such, I mean, none of this will be possible. <laughs> Uh, you know, summer of the arts, all things that we uh, we appreciate. Uh, Jewish, uh, the special Jewish uh, day. Uh, if uh, if we engage uh, in nuclear war, uh, the United States with Russia. Um, I um, <clears throat> my mom's family was Jewish, uh, from Kiev and also from. Hey, cities. Brandon. Yeah. Um, so 
This is the consent agenda. Oh, okay. But if you want to come back up during Oh, the, I didn't understand. I thought when you said uh, anything that was not on the agenda. Yeah. Um, well, that was, that was quite a mishap for me. I'm sorry. I, I feel like Mayor Bloom, who only got two years. I must, have, <laughs> I must have misspoke. Sorry about that. No, no, Is you anything? didn't. I just, I think it's the masks. All right. Sorry. So anything on the consent agenda? Anyone want to address this? Seeing no one, council discussion. I simply want to uh, congratulate and thank Ellie Meglin uh, for her recent appointment as our liaison, our student liaison. And um, Keaton Zymet is the alternate, and I look forward to meeting and uh, liaising and getting to know better. Uh, and finally, I just want to thank Anna uh, for her service. Uh, I feel like our future is very strong with um, what you guys bring to the table, and I'm just really excited and say thank you for the service that um, Anna has already provided. You're here. <laughs> Any other comments? Yeah, I just um, wanted to note on, on uh, about item 6D, just call people's attention to the, the approving a commercial energy efficiency improvement grant agreement um, between the Lazansky Corporation and the City of Iowa City. It just really allows, it's the type of grant that really allows for energy efficiency upgrades to, to important buildings. All right. Roll call, please. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. <clears throat> Motion passed to seven to zero. Now we're at item number eight, which is the consent agenda. Community comment. No. Community comment. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I am. <laughs> Sorry about that. We are at community comment. I must have said the wrong thing. All right. We are at community comment, and this is for any item that is not on our agenda, or the public can come up and share at this time. Oh, thanks. Welcome again, Brandon. Uh, Brandon Ross. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, all right. So uh, I was just about to say that I have family from uh, Poland and from Ukraine. Uh, I have noticed that there are signs up uh, in Iowa City with Iowa City's uh, logo, UNESCO City, uh, please support Ukraine. I feel this is a very polar situation right now. Uh, Ukraine's been in civil war for eight years. Uh, U.S. and NATO sent weapons into Ukraine, uh, right-wing uh, national factions, uh, fascist neo-Nazis did get a hold of those weapons. I do believe that uh, Russia intervened in the way that the U.S. intervened during the Cuban Missile Crisis. I do believe that there are spheres of influence, especially considering nuclear weapons. Uh, when Khrushchev sent uh, weapons, over to Cuba because Cuba was a sovereign state. The U.S. was bothering with military and regime change operations such as Bay, Bay of Pigs. The U.S. came back with the threat of nuclear warfare, uh, and they had a stalemate. Now, in this situation, Russia's border country, which is Ukraine, has had, uh, has had a civil war going on for eight years. Uh, there have been three leaders in Ukraine, Yanukovych, Poroshenko, and Zelensky. And uh, despite that Zelensky wants weapons and we keep sending him weapons and Nancy Pelosi promises weapons and we just spent $33 billion uh, on weaponry to send to Ukraine, I believe this is the wrong position. It is the wrong position for NATO to be involved in Ukraine. Many people have said this before, including Stephen F. Cohen, the historian of Russian, uh, the Russian historian, as well as John Mearsheimer, Russian historian, as well as Henry Kissinger, who uh, said that we should not never be uh, in Ukraine, it is a neutral state. People in Ukraine are dying. Uh, they do not care whether the bombs come from the left or the right. They do not care. A third of the country is Russian, culturally Russian, pro-Russian. A third of the country is right-wing. It's a very complex situation. So when I see the flags uh, on people's houses with Ukraine flags or buttons or things like this, I think they are fetishes and they are appalling. Uh, so my suggestion uh, is that people, if you really want to help Ukraine, all those niceties are not going to help Ukraine. More weapons are not going to help Ukraine. 
please, please call or write or both your senators, your congresspeople, the White House, and please appeal to Joe Biden and your senators and congresspeople to please withdraw weapons, withdraw NATO, and negotiate, negotiate, negotiate. The goal is detente. We can talk here all night long about all these different issues that we're interested in, but if we get a nuclear war with Ukraine, with, uh, with Russia, it's over. So I want to say that also Russia, for Jewish people, is a safer place than Ukraine, and uh, I have friends there. Thank you. So thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Anyone else want to address during this time? Welcome. And we'll ask that people give their, their name and the city they're from or, and their, um, yes, welcome. Okay, hi. My name is Mazahar Saleh. I'm the, community, I'm the director of the Center for Okay Justice. This is my name. Uh, today we just have a quick presentation about wake theft. Uh, and I will start how you do this. Uh, slideshow, right? Yeah. Uh, okay, we accept. Yeah, I just want to talk to you a little bit about the Center for Worker Justice. Uh, most of you know what we do, but for the public, we just uh, empower low wage workers to identify an issue in the community and start organizing around them. Uh, we have many victories during our, by the way, this is our 10th anniversary will be on September. So during these 10 years, we, uh, one of the victories that we have, we created the first uh, community ID in the Midwest, uh, Johnson County Community ID, where a lot of people now using it and keep this community safe. We increased the minimum wage to 1010, and you know what happened. Des Moines just, uh, you know, decided to take that opportunity from the county, but the still Center for Worker Justice did not stay silent. We reached out to a lot of businesses in the area, and they committed to uh, pay 1010 as a minimum. Uh, so, so far, we registered 165 businesses committed voluntarily to keep paying 1010 as a minimum. And also we do some kind of English classes, know your right training, and all this kind of training. One, hour, uh, one of our unique uh, projects during the pandemic, we created this program called From My Home to Yours, where we receive a lot of uh, donation from uh, you know, the caring community member where they donate the stimulus check. And also we receive some uh, fund from the city of Iowa City County, Johnson County. And so far, we help over 700 family by giving them between $300 to $600. Uh, so also we help uh, like people applying for the state programs during COVID. And uh, we, the Center for Worker Justice has recovered more than 170,000 in unpaid wages. 80% of that theft case were in Iowa City, whether the people live in Iowa City or the business in Iowa City. So uh, wake theft could be why wake, what's wake theft? Wake theft, it could be just basically you work somewhere, never get paid, or you misclassify it as independent contractor where you work hourly, or stealing tips, or like working off the clock, like many, many kind of, uh, you know, wake theft cases. And uh, I think I'm gonna turn it to, Oh, I still have 50 cents. Okay, we are, what we do, we don't like to really just highlight the business as a bad business. Our goal is just to recover wages. So the first step we do, we gather the information, give the employer a call, and after that it's work, that's fine. Otherwise, we will escalate it by sending a delegation, and some of you went in the delegation before, so to demand that employer to pay, if it's work, okay, otherwise we escalate it. We will do it uh, as a request from the employees. We escalate it to do a protest and, uh, and also at the same time filing a complaint with the Department of Labor and also do like a press release and like bring in the media and just make it like a public issue. I'm gonna turn it to Kelly to give you some example. Great, thank you, welcome. Hi, I am Kaylee Simmons. I'm a community organizer at the Center for Worker Justice. Um, so I'm gonna walk you through some examples of cases that we've seen in Iowa City. Um, this one was recovered at the beginning of 2022. So the, these two um, individuals were married and they had previously worked at the bar that was there before. Um, 
And so this new bar wanted to um, keep these old employees. So they offered to pay both of them at a rate of $25 an hour. Um, but <clears throat> they were supposed to clock in through the alarm system when they walked in the door. Um, but half the time that alarm system wasn't working. So there was sort of a miscommunication here. Um, and they only ended up getting one of them got a check for 290 something dollars. Um, so they came to us and we delivered a letter and we got in touch with the CEO of this bar and we were able to sit down and help them recover $423.32 each. Um, this was the case <clears throat> at Taco Loco in Iowa City. Again, a married couple, they were working here, they were paid in cash. Um, <clears throat> and then they stopped receiving pay altogether. When they came to CWJ, um, we also realized that they were not getting paid overtime, so we held a delegation to deliver our letter, and we ended up um, recovering $1,257.91 for Sophia and $1,182.13 for Francisco. Um, Rita Sandres, this is a case that um, is pretty public right now. Uh, Rita was not properly being paid overtime for 13 years of her employment. She was only getting paid half time or regular time instead of time and half. Um, so we've held numerous delegations, I think two or three delegations, um, to deliver a letter to the employer stating that we'd like to discuss this issue. And he was working with us at the beginning, um, but unfortunately those negotiations kind of died down. Um, so Rita wanted to escalate the situation. We held a protest and we are currently um, in the middle of negotiations. We had a meeting on Monday. We'll have a meeting on Friday about this and hopefully we can recover some overtime wages for her. Henry Torres, he works in construction. Um, we've been seeing a lot more of wage theft cases from construction. Um, he was subcontracted by a contractor to do roofing and siding, and he had been paid up until November for every job he completed, and then all of a sudden the payment stopped coming in. Um, so we held a delegation and we met with um, the employer, and he is working on payments towards um, $12,500 of unpaid wages. And Santos was misclassified as an independent contractor. He's promised a wage of $27 an hour. Um, after that, they reduced his pay by $2 an hour <clears throat> and refused insurance benefits because he was an independent contractor. Um, and so CWJ held a delegation. We helped him recover $1,109. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening. Uh, my name is Greg Hearns. I'm Go ahead. <laughs> president of Iowa City Federation of Labor, um, also vice president uh, for CWJ. Um, I just want to read something here real quick. I try not to be too redundant uh, and cover some of the same things that Mazi here said. But um, every year, far, far too many Iowans experience waste theft when they are cheated out of wages they have earned. Some are not paid for all of the hours they actually work. Some are paid off the books at less than the legal mandated minimum wage. Some earn tips that they do not get to keep. Some are not paid at all at, at uh, the legal mandated rate for overtime. Some leave a job or contract arrangement and never receive their final paycheck. Annually wage theft deprives low wage Iowa workers of an estimated $600 million, deprives state and local governments of revenue and puts law abiding businesses at a competitive disadvantage. And by the way, this report was put out in August of 2012 by uh, the Iowa Policy Project. Um, so low-wage Iowa workers miss out on an estimated 600 million in wages each year. Wage theft may be costing the state at least 45 million annually in unpaid tax revenue, plus another 14 million in lost revenue to the state's unemployment fund. Iowa's enforcement of the wage and hour laws lag far behind national and regional peers. Iowa enjoys just a single investigator to enforce the law for 1.2 million private sector workers. Wage theft disproportionately affects workers in certain sectors of Iowa economy, including restaurants, construction, small businesses, and the meatpacking and food processing industry. Wage theft has a disproportionate impact on Iowa's growing low wage workforce and on immigrant workers. I spent 40 years in organized labor. And until this report came out in 2012, I wasn't familiar at all with the term wage theft. Because in organized labor, you very seldom see wage theft. 
if someone is shorter on their paycheck because of overtime or something like that, we have a grievance process that we can go through or take it all the way to arbitration. If you're not part of a collective bargaining agreement, you don't have those resources. So that's why so many people are reaching out to the Center for Workers' Justice for help. The Center for Workers' Justice have helped people from as far north as Waterloo and far south as the uh, city of Davenport. So it shows that we're covering a lot of ground and we're making a lot of difference. It's no wonder that people who engage in waste theft don't want employees organizing. Being the only organization that fights waste theft, CWJ has fought for workers from far north of the world and south of Davenport, like I said. Uh, a few short years ago, we were able to raise the minimum wage in Iowa City and surrounding communities. It was because our community worked side by side with our elected officials that we were successful. When national lawmakers of the Moines was not willing to do so. Time and, okay, that's good. Thanks a Thank lot for you. your time, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Shel Stromquist. Uh, I'm a resident of Iowa City, and uh, I'm uh, an ally of the uh, community ally of the Center for Worker Justice and also uh, chair the Finance Committee of the Center. Um, I just want to make a few quick points complementing what you've already heard. Um, we have every indication that wage theft is not just a long-standing problem, but it's a deepening problem. And it's been deepened by the impact of the pandemic, as has so many things. Uh, the kind of industries we have in Iowa City, the construction and leisure uh, industries in particular, and restaurants and so forth, uh, are chronic uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, industries that have high levels of wage theft. And, um, and so I think it's particularly incumbent upon us as a community to begin to try to address this in a systematic and concerted way. Uh, and what we're seeing is the tip of the iceberg. Um, we know from our encounters with people who have experienced wage theft how fearful they are to come forward. These are low wage workers, many of them immigrants, many of them fearful to make claims for the wages they have actually earned. And, um, and so we feel it's particularly important now to step forward and in a sustained and concerted way uh, to address this problem as a community. And the Center for Worker Justice has a strong track record as you've seen. Um, these ARPA funds are not regular budgeted funds. These are special funds designed to address particular concerns and constraints that have developed in the pandemic. And so we urge you um, to support the proposal that we put forward to you, uh, to North Liberty, to the city of Coralville, and to, the, and to Johnson County. And the others have all uh, indicated their willingness to support this proposal. What we're basically asking for is enough support to carry on a five-year program to systematically address this issue, to begin to build trust and expand outreach in the community so that people who are fearful and hesitant to come forward realize that they have a right. They have a right to do this. Um, we need to educate the community more widely about labor rights and how uh, absolutely unfair uh, this kind of thing is. It's unfair to the, to the, obviously, to the vulnerable workers. It's also unfair to the community uh, because we, uh, it, it means, among other things, lost purchasing power uh, and unpaid taxes. It's unfair to employers who do the right thing. So we as a community need to be more concerted and we want to be able to train volunteers in a more systematic way, to draw on other allies, to facilitate a broader network in the community uh, that Thank can you. really systematically address this. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And anyone else? I do see uh, someone online. I'm going to welcome Noah. Welcome. Hello, you can hear me, right? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. A couple things tonight. Okay, so last week, I'm mean, not myself as a cop, but I called 911 because I saw one of ICPD's cop cars driving completely recklessly without their emergency, without any light sirens or anything. That if any person who was not a cop drove, had driven like that, they would have been immediately pulled over for reckless driving. So, I mean, and this is not the first time I've seen ICPD uh, drive recklessly without any, any lights or anything like that. 
Uh, the ICBD is notorious for just turning on their lights to go through stop signs, stop lights, red lights, because they think they're above the law and they get to just bypass it and they get away with it because they're cops. Who's going to stop them? The cops? No, obviously not. Um, so yeah, that's just that's just emblematic of the toxic culture that's just deep within ICPD that is not reformable, which is why the only way forward is to defund them and to take away their power by defunding them and not letting them in positions where they can abuse their power with like they constantly do when they're on our roads and they make our roads not safe. Anyways, okay. Um, and then the city refuses to release body cam footage of complaints against ICBD because they, the city has chosen that they would rather protect cops rather than let the public see the complaints against cops. And I'm just going to talk about what I've been talking about, I don't know, since, I mean, y'all change your rules. Um, the city is currently forced people to live outside because you are not providing a 24-7 low barrier emergency shelter, especially since the winter shelter is no longer no longer an option in shelter house. It has turned people away because there is not enough capacity in shelter house. And the city, by its inaction, is forcing people to live outside. So stop forcing people to live outside. Open the emergency shelter now. I would y'all do something. Stop forcing people to live outside. Laura, stop forcing people to live outside. Bruce, stop forcing people to live outside. Pauline, stop forcing people to live outside. John, stop forcing people to live outside. Sean, stop forcing people to live outside. Pauline, stop. Sorry, uh, Janice, I mean, stop forcing people to live outside. I think I named you all. Oh, sorry. Oh, and Megan, stop forcing people to live outside. Redmond, stop forcing people to live outside. And Jeff, especially fuck you, you're a fascist, and stop forcing people to live outside. You're a liar too, Jeff. You're a, like a massive liar, and you can't answer your damn emails. Jeff, Redmond, and all of you, answer your gosh damn emails. Is it really that hard to answer emails and stop forcing you to live outside? Because I feel like, you, I mean, obviously you refuse because you don't give a shit about the houseless community. That's why you force them to live outside. That's the only conclusion that any reasonable person can come to because you refuse to provide shelter to them. You should be ashamed. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address a topic that is not on our agenda? Seeing no one, thanks to everyone that has been a part of our community comment. We are on to item number nine, which is 2022 water pavement patching. This is a resolution approving project manual and estimate of cost for the construction of the 2022 water pavement patching project, establishing amount of bids, security to accompany each bid, directing city clerk to post notice to bidders and fixing time and place for receipt of bids. I'm gonna open up the public hearing and welcome. Thank you. Just a second. So I'm Mari Van Dyke, I'm with engineering. Um, this is an annual project where we repair pavement that was damaged from water main breaks. Um, so basically when there's a water main break, the water division will repair the main and then if pavement was damaged, they'll backfill with rock or do a temporary asphalt patch. And then this project combines all of the permanent pavement re repairs into one project. So these are the locations for this year. So they all had a water main break this past winter or early spring. Um, and so they all need uh, street, sidewalk, or driveway repairs. And then as additional water main breaks occur, we'll add those to this project as well. So the estimated construction cost just for the previously listed sites is $175,000. The bid opening would be May 25th and we'd award the contract June 6th. Then the, we'd have the contract until the beginning of November, but construction for each individual site would only last about a week. So that's kind of an overview of the project and I'm happy to answer any questions. No questions, thank you. 
Would anyone from the public like to address this topic? If so, uh, please come forth. Welcome. Next one. Okay, all right. <laughs> uh, seeing no one, council, I'm gonna close the public hearing. Could I get a motion to approve, please? So move, Thomas. Second, Taylor. Council discussion. Roll call, please. Weiner? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Item number 10 is 2022 Rochester Avenue reconstruction from Ralston Creek to North First Avenue. This is a resolution approving project manual and estimate of cost for the construction of the 2022 Rochester Avenue reconstruction from Ralston Creek to North First Avenue project. Establishing amount of bid security to accompany each bid, directing city clerk to post notice to bidders, and fixing time and place for receipt of bids. I'm gonna open the public hearing. And welcome. Good evening, Council Mayor. I'm Justin Harlan. I'm with engineering. I'm a senior engineer for the city of Iowa City. And we're going to talk about the Rochester Ave <coughs> reconstruction project. So I'd like to start out with a little bit of background. Uh, Rochester Ave serves an arterial street, averages about 7,000 vehicles a day. It also goes primary by the Regina schools. Um, it requires frequent maintenance for potholes, cracking, and spalling, and it's kind of at the end of its useful service life. When I say end of the service life, I mean that we're putting more resources and money into it than we're getting out of it. Um, in 2019, Center and Associates was hired to perform design services, which included a traffic study. In 2020, that traffic study was complete. It recommended the complete reconstruction, and on the western end, it uh, recommended to do a three to, three to two conversion. Uh, part of the reasoning behind that three to two conversion on the western end was with that, um, it kind of encouraged traffic calming, which thus kind of reduced speeds, uh, which has been noted as a problem in that corridor. With the three to two conversion, this also allows the roadway to accommodate or accommodate bicycle lanes. So as a brief project overview, this is a full reconstruction, as I said. Um, it includes storm sewer, water main improvements, as long as ADA improvements. Uh, it does include new traffic signals at Rochester and First Avenue. Um, the speed limit will remain at 25 miles an hour. That is the design speed that we've chosen. And we've also tried to lessen the environmental impacts of this. Um, you know, we've tried to be very mindful of protecting trees uh, where we can't protect. Uh, we are uh, going back and planting a few more trees um, with the project. So just to give you a kind of overview of the project limits, uh, we start on the west end by Ralston Creek, and we move back to the east up through the First Avenue intersection. Kind of with this, our primary detour routes that we'll be focusing on will be Court Street, First Ave, Seventh Ave, and Muscatine Ave. As you can see, with Seventh Ave, Seventh Ave being in the project, um, it will be closed for a short time. But as we move further on, that will open back up, and we can use that. So, kind of the typical sections of the roadway. Um, this one, there's three different typical sections. Um, they all kind of include similar attributes, but each one a little different. Um, so the first one we're going to talk about is just your two through lanes with bike lanes. They're going to be 10 foot lanes, six foot bike lanes, and you'll have a foot and a half buffer for the bike lanes. You'll also have a four foot minimum parkway. You'll have a five foot sidewalk and we'll include ADA curb ramps. That's kind of standard throughout the project. Uh, the water main and storm sewers will shift sides. Uh, this configuration or this typical section will be the typical section for the project and that will go from Montrose up to 7th Avenue and then also from Ashwood to Reland Court. So our second one uh, is the cross section that goes from that North 7th Avenue up to Ashwood. It does not include sidewalk on the south side as we've kind of discussed over um, other council meetings that was a that was decided. Uh, it does include a retaining wall with a paved parkway. 
the retaining wall heights will vary from two and a half foot to five and a half foot. And the parkway will be entirely paved. I know it kind of shows on that cross section, there's a little green there on the right side. That will be paved, it allows for snow storage, as well as lessens the maintenance on residents to go out there and mow it and city staff. So our third section is kind of the section up by Regina Schools. It kind of goes from Ashwood up to that first Ave. Um, there will be a two-way left turn lane or twiddle. It includes bike lanes. That twiddle will be 11 foot. Also includes, you know, your sidewalks, ADA ramps, and it will include a pedestrian island for refuge uh, for pedestrians crossing that way. We know there's a large volume of pedestrians that cross that location and we would like to increase their safety where possible. So some of the unique project features, um, you don't see those on, see these on every project. You'll see a few, but these are kind of what makes each project different. Um, for this one, we're gonna install a pressure release valve vault or a PRV. It's installed near the First Avenue and Rochester Avenue intersection. And this is part of our water department's plan uh, for water pressure zoning. Uh, we create consistent zones throughout the city. It helps service and our water infrastructure. We're also gonna install that pedestrian island. I've kind of hit on that a little bit. It's located near the West Regina driveway. It's a pick in that, or picture in the lower right corner. And it just increases pedestrian safety, or that's the intent. Um, another one you'll see is somewhat unique to this one is the conversion of overhead to underground utilities. And, you know, currently, if anybody's driven by the corridor, you'll notice some construction. Uh, currently, Mid-American's in there converting overhead to underground. Uh, a lot of those are your electrical services, your communication services, or telecommunication services. Um, you will see, still see street lights, so there will still be poles out there, but it, re it reduces damage. Like when we see major storm events, you know, those are now underground and not hanging above your head on poles. Kind of the project timeline. Um, obviously, we're here today on May 3rd, holding the public hearing. Uh, the bid letting is scheduled for May 24th or date June 6th. Construction start is July 5th of this year. I'll kind of get into the phasing of this project after this slide so we can break that down a little more. A milestone completion is scheduled in December. Now that milestone, um, what that is, is we want to, or we're shooting for the pavement through the west leg of the First Avenue intersection to be done in December of 23. This allows other projects that we're working on, for instance, Court Street, if that schedule falls through, to detour through Rochester. The final completion date will be September 30th of 2024, with the opinion of probable cost at 5.6 million. Initially, we thought the project could be done in 2023 uh, with the dollar amount and the scope that we have in the plans. Uh, we felt that that was put a big burden on the contractors and as well as drive up our bid prices. So we have gave them the option to complete that east leg of the First Avenue and Rochester intersection in 2024. So to kind of go through the further phasing, that stage one, which is from Ralston Creek to kind of halfway in between Rochester Court and Windsor Drive, that will be scheduled for the summer and fall of this year, 2022. Stage two will continue on towards the west. So where we pick up on 22, we'll go into 23, looking to go to uh, Reedlin Court, and that will be kind of the spring and summer of 23. Our idea is to stage the Rochester Court reconstruction in front of the Regina schools during the summer while school is out. That is the intent. Um, whether it happens that way, that's kind of up to the contractor and our construction seasons and weather. We go further west to the west leg of the First Avenue Rochester intersection. Uh, there needs to be some temporary pavement that goes there. That's why you're seeing the schedule or the stage 4A, 4B, and 4C. So 4A will be the temporary pavement that allows through traffic and turn movements through there so we can keep the First Avenue intersection open. And then the West Lake will com be completed in the summer and fall of 2023. That just leaves the East Lake of the First Avenue intersection 
in the spring and summer of 2024. With that, I'll close that out and open it up to questions. Uh, uh, is it is it Seventh Avenue that is the um, entrance into Hickory Hill Park? Yes, I believe it is. Is was there any consideration of putting in a pedestrian island at that intersection? I cannot answer that for the for the design. Um, I know that we we've asked Snyder to include as many you know pedestrian accommodation facilities as we as we can. Um, I don't know if specifically that was looked into. Um, I can find out for you if you would like. Yeah, I think that, you know, it seems to me, I'm sure there's quite a bit of, of movement across Rochester at that location, maybe not as high as at the school, but right. Hickory Hill is a major destination, so I would expect there's quite a bit of it. I mean, I would, I would imagine that the, um, is there another, if there, if some of the schedule were to slip for around Regina, is there another way to get in there or would, the, uh, or does that just really we have? Does that really have to end up being during that spring, that summer? So the nice thing with Regina is they do have two driveways or two entrances that we could possibly use. Uh, we could also utilize temporary pavements to make sure that they have that there. Um, that being said, it's still going to be an inconvenience if that were to happen. Uh, but I think we've been in contact with them, and I think we can work something with them that works for everyone. Okay. I was just going to mention something about the uh, the question about the, the pedestrian refuge, refuge at 7th Avenue. The challenge that's going to be there is really the space within the corridor. So the one up at Regina we're putting in there because it's going to be a three-lane section. There's not an opposing left turn movement there, so there's a space there that we can put that in without taking away something else. Uh, at 7th Avenue, the challenge that you get into is it's a tight corridor. We aren't looking at getting additional right away, and with uh, left turns there, there's not that same condition that we were doing with the, the Regina location. So I think it's just, they're a little bit different, and there's just, with having the, the goal being to go to two lanes and narrow up the roadway, that sort of is contour to what the, the pedestrian refuge would require. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. All right. Would anyone from the public like to address this topic? And welcome, Noah. Hello. Hello. So can you hear me? Hello. Yes. So my comment relates to this because currently the city, some streets, is currently the city is forcing people to live on the streets by not providing All right. emergency housing. You to need those to stay on topic. I'm going to end the conversation now. Thank you. Actually, no, because I'm not done, Bruce. You're done. I'm not Thank done you. Talking. We need people to stay on topic. Uh, anyone else like to address this topic? Seeing no one, I'm going to close the public hearing. Can I get a motion to approve, please? So moved. Weiner. Second, Taylor. Council discussion. Gonna Roll call. Long, oh, please. It's going to be a long project. I mean, people, people, there are, there are a lot of people up there. People are really going to have to get used to having their lives and, and roots disrupted and, and, be, and be prepared for it. And I guess well, that will require a fair amount of communication as well. So that, I mean, it's, it's needed. And it's going to be a big, long project. Mm -hmm. Roll call, please. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Motion passed to 7 to 0. Item number 11 is Eastwood Drive South Lawn Drive intersection improvement. Resolution approving project manual and estimate of cost for the construction of the Eastwood Drive and South Lawn Drive intersection improvement project. Establish an amount of bid security to accompany each bid. Direct the city clerk to post notice to bidders and fix in time and place for receipt of bids. I'm gonna open the public hearing and welcome. Mr. Mayor and Council, good evening. Good evening. My name is Aline Dumaki and I'm a civ uh, senior civil engineer in the public works department. Today I'll be giving you a brief overview of the proposed uh, imp improvement at Eastwood Drive and South Lawn Drive in the city of Iowa City. Uh, the project 
uh, just like the title says, is located at the intersection of Eastwood Drive and South Lawn Drive. Um, at the northeast, northwest corner of Lucas Elementary. The existing condition at this intersection show the pavement is beyond uh, useful life and there is deficient street drainage, deter uh, deteriorated pavement. Southeast storm intake is severely damaged and is currently covered with uh, steel plate, which presents a hazard for vehicle traffic and pedestrians. Uh, sidewalk ramps are currently not ADA compliant, and this project will address all these issues. The proposed improvements um, are replacing the existing storm sewer system with new storm sewer pipe and intakes, upgrade existing uh, six inch ductile iron water main to eight inch PVC pipe, new eight inch uh, pavement with six inch integral curb and sub drains, new curb ram ramps to meet ADA compliance, the relocation of an existing uh, fire hydrant. Some of the estimated quantities are 101 linear feet of storm sewer and associated structures, approximately 343 square yards of pavement replacement, approximately 156 linear feet of trenched water main, and approximately 100, 106 square yards of sidewalk replacement and associated landscape restoration. The estimated cost for this project is $225,000 and the construction is scheduled to begin June 3rd with substantial completion date the Friday before the school starts, August 19, 2022 and the final completion date of September 30th, 2022. And with this, if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to address them. Sorry, can you just repeat when the beginning of the project? Beginning of the project would be June 3rd. And end in September? September 30th. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Anyone from the public like to address this topic? And I'm gonna welcome Noah. I do wanna say that I've already warned you that you must stay on topic. Um, if you do not stay on topic after this, um, you will not be recognized the rest of this meeting. But we do wanna hear from you, so welcome Noah. Hello. Welcome. Hello, yes. All you bastards, stop forcing the to live outside. Stop Thank forcing you. people to live Thank outside. You. Anyone else from the public like to address this topic? Seeing no one, I'm gonna close the public hearing. Can I get a motion to approve, please? So moved. Second. Moved by Weiner, seconded by Alter. Alter. Uh, council discussion. Roll call, please. Burgess? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Alter. Yes. Motion passed is seven to zero. Item number 12 is transit funding application. This is a resolution authorizing the filing of an application with the Iowa Department of Transportation for the fiscal year 2023. Iowa Department of Transportation State Transit Assistance and Federal Transit Administration funding. I'm gonna open the public hearing and I'm going to welcome our staff, welcome. Good evening, Mayor, Council. Good to see you all back at home again. Yes. Um, the MPO of Johnson County is going to be filing on our behalf a consolidated uh, funding application, transit funding application, on behalf of Iowa City Transit with the Iowa DOT. This is an annual process. Um, you see me about this time every year. Um, we um, 
we are essentially asking for what is really formula funding. It's kind of our formal approval process um, uh, to request the funding for both our state DOT funding, federal funding, and for our wish list of items, which we, we have a long wish list of items for transit. So in terms of state transit assistance program, the request is for approximately 571,000. For in terms of our federal operating assistance, it's approximately $1.9 million in annual funding. And then it, for our paratransit services, it's approximately 155,000 uh, in annual funding. Um, and the request, I would call it the wish list items um, in terms of um, what we hope to receive federal funding for um, is uh, $21 million, and of course is inclusive of um, funding for a potential transit facility. So we want to make sure we keep that item on our wish list um, in the hopes of um, being granted grant awards um, in the future. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have about this application process. Sounds like you're getting off easy. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone from the public like to address this topic? Seeing no one, I'm going to close the public hearing. Can I get a motion to approve, please? So moved. Seconded, Burgess. Moved by Taylor, seconded by Burgess. Council discussion. Roll call, please. Harmson? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Motion passed to 7 to 0. Item number 13 is utility rate public hearing resolution. Ordinance amending Title III and Title Finance, Taxation and Fees, Chapter 4 and Title Schedule of Fees, Rates, Charges, Bonds, Fines and Penalties, Article 5 and Title Solid Waste Disposal. And this is second consideration. Could I get a motion, please? So moved, Weiner. Second, Harmson. And council discussion. Roll call, please. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Motion passed to 7 to 0. Item number 14 is 2022 bond resolution. Resolution direct and direct resolution direct and sell of 10,255,000 general obligation bond series 2022. Can I get a motion to approve, please? So moved, Burgess. Second, Weiner. All right, and welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, so this is for our geo bond issue that happened this morning, our bond sale. And so here today is Maggie Berger from Spear Financial, who is our financial advisor, and she's going to walk you guys through the results. Thank you and welcome. Thank you very much, Mayor and Council. As Nicole mentioned, my name is Maggie Berger with Spear Financial. We did take bids this morning on $10,255,000 of General Obligation Bond Series 2022. You did receive four bids as part of that 30-minute uh, window, and we are recommending the lowest true interest rate by law from Morgan Stanley and Company of New York, New York, at a true interest rate of 2.935. You can see from the first uh, to the last, we range from a 2.9355 down to a 3.0586. We've also included that uh, Moody's Investors Rating Report. The city does do this exercise when they're issuing debt, and you were reaffirmed at the AAA status, which is the highest um, that you can acquire from the rating agency. They always talk about how stable. Um, your credit profile is. The economic base is very stable here. Always we talk about what could lead to a downgrade, um, substantial and sustained reduction in reserve funds. We will say it again and again, Moody's and any other rating agency loves cash. They want to make sure that you have plenty of cash on hand to operate the city in a time of, of need. Uh, this goes on and talks about how you have grown your tax base by an average annual of 5.7% um, annually, that your median family income is 108% of the national median income, which is fantastic for them. It also talks about how you, across all funds, have 65 million or 80% of uh, your fiscal year 21 operating revenue as reserve funds, and that, again, is, is a cash reserve that they like. Amherst 
amortization is rapid within the city with 100% of your general obligation debt, principal and interest being paid within a 10 year period. So they do include the scorecard um, on the uh, second to the last page of the report. And that does indicate, you know, where um, you are in line with a double A, triple A, single A categories. Uh, we've seen some upward movement as well in fund balance and, and that's always um, helpful to them. We've included the bid and bidders tabulation so that you can see the interest rates that were bid. And as part of this sale, you are receiving a small premium. We'll say small in comparison to years in the past. And really that uh, premium is about 535,000. That is excess money that can be used not only for the debt service payments, but also any cost overruns on these projects that were part of this issuance. The final debt service schedule is on the back page. And we do always protect the city with a call feature. And that just means that the bonds become optionally redeemable after June 1st of 2028. Once that payment is made, you could call the bonds in whole or in part anytime after that date. You would also have the opportunity to refund them if interest rates are lower than that remaining four uh, down to a 3.3%. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, that you have this evening. Very detailed report. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Would anyone like to address this topic? Seeing no one from the public, council discussion. Roll call, please. Could, could we oh, did we, I don't think we had motions, uh, Mayor. No, we don't have motions, but yeah, I wanted we to. We did? Ferguson oh. Weiner. We oh, did, right. Sorry, my apologies. Um, but I, I just wanted to note that it, um, it really is to our advantage to, to maintain the AAA rating because we um, we get essentially more bang for a buck. Um, we it, it and it's a it puts us in a much better financial position, uh, and it, it costs us less to get the money. And, and I think the timing of this was great too because I think the Fed is about to raise rates. So I just like to say, uh, Susan Mims, if you're listening, you always stressed about the AAA rating, and I never did quite understand it. But thank you for helping me to understand it. And here we are. Great. <laughs> Thank you to staff and for shepherding and, and, and protecting the money and making wise choices and um, allowing us to be able to enjoy this. All right. Roll call, please. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Motion passed to seven to zero. Item number 15 is the assessment schedule. Resolution adopting an assessment schedule of unpaid mowing, cleaning up of property, snow removal, sidewalk repair, and stop box re repair charges, and directing the city clerk to certify the same to Johnson County Treasurer for collection in the same manner as property taxes. And can I get a motion to approve, please? So moved, Thomas. Second, Burgess. And anyone from the public like to address this topic? Seeing no one, council discussion? Roll call, please. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Motion passed to seven to zero. Item number 16 is announcement of vacancies new. Applicants must reside in Iowa City and be 18 years of age unless specific qualifications are stated. Senior Center Commission, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term, effective upon appointment through December 31st, 2024. Applications must be received by 5 p.m. Tuesday, June 14th, 2022. Can I get a motion to accept correspondence? So moved, Taylor. Second, Alter. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes seven to zero. Item number 17 is an announcement of vacancies previous. Applicants must reside in Iowa City and be 18 years of age unless specific qualifications are stated. Civil Service Commission, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term. Applications must be received by 5 p.m. Tuesday, May 31st, 2022. Airport Commission, two vacancies to fill a four-year term. Historic Preservation Commission at large, one vacancy to fill a three-year term. Historic Preservation Commission Brown Street, one vacancy to fill a three-year term. 
Historic Preservation Commission Jefferson Street, one vacancy to fill a three-year term. Historic Preservation Commission Summit Street, one vacancy to fill a three-year term. Housing and Community Development, three vacancies to fill a three-year term. Library Board of Trustees, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term. Planning and Zoning Commission, one vacancy to fill a five-year term. Applications must be received by 5 p.m. Tuesday, May 10th, 2022. Airport Zoning Board of Adjustment, one vacancy to fill a five-year five -year term. Airport Zoning Commission, Iowa City Representative, one vacancy to fill a six-year term. Board of Appeals, Building Design Professional, one vacancy to fill a five-year term. Historic Preservation Commission, East College Street, one vacancy to fill a three-year term. Historic Preservation Commission, Jefferson Street, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term. Public Art Advisory Committee, one, vac one vacancy to fill an unexpired term. Public Art Advisory Committee, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term. Vacancies will remain open until filled. And we are at item number 18, which is City Council Information. I just um, put out that the electric bus bash is rain or shine this Friday afternoon at 2 p.m. Looks like it's going to be over in the Chauncey if it's, if it's going to rain. But I guess they will put out that. Farmer's market starts on Saturday. Um, so whether, whether or not it looks like spring, it's here. Um, and there are a lot of events going on this weekend, including the NAMI walk and some other events. I just wanted to say thank you to those who came out for the uh, premiere of A Decent Home last week uh, in Iowa City. Uh, I know that uh, several members of council were able to make it, and uh, those who weren't have been showing a lot of interest in learning more about what was, was in the film. And so I uh, appreciate that because that really touches on our, our affordable housing crisis uh, locally and across the country. Um, so th thank you for everybody in the community who, who got out to see that. That was a very powerful film, um, and your mom was one of the stars, so that was kind of fun, too. Uh, I might be a little biased and very <laughs> proud of her for, uh, for doing that work, so. I just actually want to mention, I had a lovely meeting with um, a pickleball club that was uh, at Mercer Park, and it was to, to look at the courts, um, but I now have a standing offer to learn. Uh, free lesson. Um, they don't charge for them. So, <laughs> um, but no, it, they're just an amazingly enthusiastic and passionate group of people who, in fact, have been, um, you know, kind of, they said during COVID, this was kind of a lifesaver for them to be able to be around and to, you know, draw some pleasure um, and I learned about pickleball in ways that I knew nothing about I didn't realize it was as huge as it is and so um, and it's all ages I mean I met with some folks who they were in their 80s um, but they're like they're they're teaching junior high kids so it was just a really cool thing and it's growing like crazy so um, I just wanted to take an opportunity to shout out Myra and um, Dwayne and Jill Miller those were some ambassadors I'm not sure if that's the exact name for them, but um, I think they self-styled it, so. I did want to mention that I had an opportunity to see Pierre and Natasha the, in The Great Comet of 1812, which was a production of Riverside Theater. And uh, congratulations to Riverside Theater. That, that is truly an extraordinary perform, uh, production um, for our Iowa City Theater to be able to pull that off was really an accomplishment. Um, unfortunately, I think it's sold out now for the rest of its run, which may be through May 7th. I, I wish they could extend it because um, not many people can attend any one showing. <laughs> and, and it's such a large production. You know, you, you, I would want it to have a, as large an audience as it deserves. But in any event, congratulations to Riverside and all who participated. All right, any other comments? I did want to just again um, say thanks to Councilor Weiner and to Mayor Pro, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem and to all of the counselors that's been uh, filling in last week. I was on vacation, a very much needed vacation. Um, and there were great events happening um, that uh, counselors um, 
uh, definitely stepped in. I know Councillor Burgess was over in the South District, um, busy over there, and I and our councillors are real engaged. Uh, we just heard Councillor Thomas talking about, you know, Riverside Theater. There's so much happening, and I do encourage people to get out, uh, rain or shine. <laughs> We're gonna move on to item number 19, which is report on items from city staff. And we'll start with our city manager. <clears throat> nothing tonight, Mayor. Yes, and we're gonna start with our city attorney. Uh, nothing for me, thank you. And then our city clerk. Nope. All right, and item number 20, can we get a motion to adjourn? I'll move, Taylor. Second, Weiner. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? We are adjourned. Mm -hmm. Have a good evening, everyone.